Hi, my name is Grace, and I'm an events associate here at the University Bookstore. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and supporting your local independent bookstore. We host about 500 author events a year, and you can keep track of them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as on our website. A um, couple of events that we have coming up, we have Patricia Briggs on March 8th and Mark Tompkins on March 9th. In his latest book, critically acclaimed cult novelist Matt Ruff blends historical fiction, pulp noir, and Lovecraftian horror fantasy, I said that right, <laughs> in an utterly original take on Jim Crow America in the 1950s. On the surface, Lovecraft Country tells the story of 22-year-old African-American army veteran and science fiction buff Atticus Turner and his road trip, along with his uncle and, fr and childhood friend, to find his missing father. What makes it so much more is a mix of supernatural horrors and mundane terrors of white America they encounter along the way, and the secret ritualistic society waiting for them at the end. Local author Ma Ma Matt Ruff is the, author, <laughs> is the author of the critically acclaimed novels Bad Monkeys, Set This House in Order, Fool on the Hill, and Sewer, Gas, and Electric. A few announcements before we start. The store will close at 8 p.m., and while we're free to stay on for the duration of the event, registers will close at 8, so we ask that you please make all book purchases before then. If you parked in the back lot, I'll be happy to validate your parking. And now, please join me in welcoming Matt Ruff. So, um, well, thank you all for coming. Um, so, like my last novel, this started out as an unsuccessful TV series pitch. Um, <laughs> I wanted to do something like The X-Files, where a recurring cast of characters would have weekly paranormal adventures. And the first question you got to answer when you do a story like that is, what job do these people have that has them constantly running into monsters? Um, most of us, you get one night in a haunted house or one distant glimpse of Bigfoot, and that's your lifetime quota. So what's special about these people? And I wanted to answer that in a way that would allow for a different group of protagonists and a different set of cultural concerns than you'd ordinarily get in a story like this. Um, so I've been reading a book by James Lowen called Sundown Towns, which is about the history of whites-only communities in America. And one of the things he talks about is during the Jim Crow era, there were these travel guides for black motorists that would list um, hotels and restaurants across the country that would accept their business because they couldn't just stop somewhere along the road if you're traveling from, say, Chicago to Seattle. You couldn't just pull up to a motel and expect to necessarily be given a room. So. Um, so what I wanted to do, I, I had this idea that my Fox Mulder character would be a field researcher for one of these travel guides. And his job would be to drive around the country looking for places that would serve him. And I was also going to make him a Pulp Fiction fan, um, someone who loved science fiction and fantasy, even if they didn't always love him back, and who, if he saw Bigfoot, would be intrigued rather than frightened. But the real explanation for why he was constantly running into monsters was because he was black. And when you're black in America, there's always a monster. Um, sometimes it's the elder gods from beyond time and space, and sometimes it's the police or the Ku Klux Klan um, or the registrar of voters. And um, how H.P. Lovecraft came into this, he was sort of my bridge between these two types of horror, where um, on the one hand, he's, he's justly recognized as, as one of the best horror writers of the early 20th century, but uh, on the other hand, he was a white supremacist, a very proud one, um, who would have approved of the segregationist laws that my character had to deal with all the time. So Lovecraft Country became a way of referring both to the paranormal realm where monsters come from and to America where monsters come from. Um, so the TV people didn't go for that. <laughs> I, I thought it would make a really cool show. They, they passed. Um, but the idea stayed with me, and I spent a few more years thinking about how I could make it work as a novel. So, and um, here I am. So, so the novel opens with a quote from the summer 1954 edition of the Safe Negro Travel Guide. Jim Crow Mile, 
a unit of measurement peculiar to colored motorists, comprising both physical distance and random helpings of fear, paranoia, frustration, and outrage. Its amorphous nature makes exact travel times impossible to calculate, and its violence puts the traveler's good health and safety constantly at hazard. Atticus was almost home when the state trooper pulled him over. He'd left Jacksonville two days before in a second-hand 48 Cadillac coupe that he'd bought with the last of his army pay. The first day he drove 450 miles, eating and drinking from a basket he'd packed in advance, stopping the car only to get gas. At one of the gas stops, the colored restroom was out of order, and when the attendant refused him the key to the white's room, Atticus was forced to urinate in the bushes behind the station. He spent the night in Chattanooga. The Safe Negro Travel Guide had listings for four hotels and a motel, all in the same part of the city. Atticus chose the motel, which had an attached 24-hour diner. The price of the room, as promised by the guide, was $3. In the diner the next morning, he consulted a road atlas. He had another 600 miles to go to Chicago. Midway along his intended route was the city of Louisville, Kentucky, which, according to the guide, had a restaurant that would serve him lunch. Atticus considered it, but any inclination to further delay his homecoming was overwhelmed by a desire to put the South behind him. So after he finished breakfast, he got the basket from his car and had the diner cook fill it with sandwiches and cokes and cold fried chicken. Around 1 p.m. he reached the Ohio River, which marked the border between Kentucky and Indiana. As he crossed the water on a bridge named for a dead slave owner, Atticus cocked his arm out the window and bade Jim Crow farewell with a raised middle finger. A white driver coming the other way saw the gesture and shouted something vile, but Atticus just laughed and stepped on the gas and so passed into the north. An hour later, along a stretch of farmland, the Cadillac blew a tire. Atticus wrestled the car to a safe stop at the roadside and got out to put on the spare, but the spare was flat too. He was frustrated by this. He checked the spare before setting out and it had seemed fine then, but however much he frowned at it, the spare remained resolute in its flatness. A southern tire, Atticus thought. Jim Crow's revenge. Behind him for at least 10 miles, there was nothing but fields and woods, but looking ahead on the road, he could see, perhaps two miles distant, a cluster of buildings. Taking the safe Negro travel guide with him, he started walking. There was traffic on the road, and at first, as he walked, he tried waving down vehicles that were headed his way, but the drivers all either ignored him or sped up to get past him, and eventually he gave up and just concentrated on putting one foot in front of the other. He came to the first of the buildings. The sign out front said Jansen's Auto Repair, and Atticus thought he might be in luck until he saw the Confederate flag hanging above the garage entrance. That was almost enough to make him keep walking, but he decided he had to try. Inside the garage were two white men, a little fellow with a peach fuzz mustache who sat in a high stool reading a magazine, and a much bigger man who was bent under the open hood of a pickup truck. As Atticus entered, the little man looked up from his magazine and made a rude sucking sound between his teeth. Excuse me, Atticus said. This got the attention of the big man. As he straightened up and turned around, Atticus saw he had a tattoo of what looked like a wolf's head on his forearm. Sorry to disturb you, Atticus said, but I've had some trouble. I need to buy a tire. The big man glared at him for a moment, then said flatly, no. I can see you're busy, said Atticus, as if that might be the problem. I'm not asking you to change it for me. Just sell me the tire and I'll... No. I don't understand. You don't want my money? You don't have to do anything, just... No. The big man crossed his arms. You need me to say it another 50 times? Because I will. And Atticus, fuming now, said, that's a wolfhound tattoo, right? 27th Infantry Regiment? He fingered the service pin on his own lapel. I was with the 24th Infantry. We fought alongside the 27th across most of Korea. I wasn't in Korea, the big man said. I was at Guadalcanal and Luzon, and there weren't any niggers there. With that, he bent into the truck hood again, his back both a dismissal and an invitation leaving Atticus to decide which way he wanted to take it. The collective indignities of the past months in Florida made it a closer call than Atticus liked. The little man on the stool was still looking at him, and if he'd said anything or even cracked a smile, Atticus would have gone in swinging. But the little man, perhaps sensing how quickly he could lose his teeth, even with the big man to protect him, did not smile or speak, and Atticus stalked off with his fists at his sides. Across the road was a general store with a payphone on its front porch. Atticus looked in the guide and found a listing for a Negro-owned garage in Indianapolis, some 50 miles away. He placed the call and explained his predicament to the mechanic who answered. The mechanic was sympathetic and agreed to come help, but warned that it would be a while. That's okay, Atticus said. I'll be here. He hung up and noticed the old woman inside the general store watching him nervously through the screen door. Once again, he chose to turn and walk away. He went back to the car. In the trunk beside the useless spare was a cardboard box filled with battered paperbacks. 
Atticus selected a copy of Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. He sat in the Cadillac and read about the rocket summer of 1999, when winter snows were melted by the exhaust from a Mars-bound spacecraft. He imagined himself aboard, rising into the sky on a jet of fire, leaving north and south behind forever. Four hours passed. He read all of the Martian Chronicles. He drank warm Coke and ate a sandwich, but mindful of the gaze of passing motorists, he did not touch the fried chicken. He perspired in the breezeless June heat. When his bladder could no longer be ignored, he waited for a lull in the traffic and went behind a sycamore that grew by the roadside. It was after 7 o'clock when the tow truck arrived. The driver, a gray-haired, light-skinned Negro, introduced himself as Earl Mabry. Earl, just Earl, he insisted, when Atticus tried to call him Mr. Mabry. He lifted the replacement tire from the rear of the tow truck. Let's get you back on your way. With the two of them working together, it took less than 10 minutes. The simplicity of it and the thought of the afternoon just wasted for no good reason started Atticus fuming again. He stepped away from the car to compose himself, pretending to study the sun now hanging low on the horizon. How far do you have to go, Earl asked him. Chicago. Earl raised an eyebrow. Tonight? Well, that was the plan. Tell you what, Earl said. I'm done for the day. Why don't you come home with me and let my wife fix you a real dinner? Maybe rest a while. No, sir, I couldn't. Sure you could. It's on your way, and I wouldn't want you to leave Indiana thinking it's all bad people. Earl lived in the color district around Indiana Avenue, northwest of the state capitol building. His house was a narrow wooden two-story with a tiny patch of grass out front. When they arrived, the sun had set and clouds were blowing in from the north, hastening the darkness. In the street, a stickball game was in progress, but now the mothers of the players were calling them inside. Earl and Atticus went inside, too. Earl's wife, Mavis, greeted Atticus warmly and showed him where he could wash up. Despite the welcome, Atticus was apprehensive sitting down at the kitchen table for many of the obvious topics of dinner conversation, his service in Korea, his stay in Jacksonville, today's events, and most of all his father in Chicago were things he didn't really care to talk about. But after they had said grace, Earl surprised them by asking what he thought of the Martian Chronicles. I saw you had it in the car. So they talked about Ray Bradbury and Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov, all of whom Earl liked, and L. Ron Hubbard, whom he didn't and the Tom Swift series, which Earl had loved when he was young, but which embarrassed him now, both for the book's depiction of Negroes and for the fact that as a boy he hadn't noticed it, despite his father's repeated attempts to point it out to him. Yeah, my pop had some problems with my reading choices too, Atticus said. Mavis said little during the meal, seeming content to listen and to refill Atticus's plate whenever it was in danger of being emptied. By the time they finished dessert, it was full dark and rain was drumming on the kitchen window. Well, Mavis spoke up at last, you can't drive any farther tonight in this. Atticus, past the point of even token resistance, allowed himself to be led upstairs to the spare bedroom. There on the dresser was a photograph of a young man in uniform. A black ribbon had been tied around a corner of the frame. Our Dennis, Mavis said, or so Atticus thought. But as she began to put fresh sheets in the bed, she added, he died in the forest, and Atticus realized she was talking about the Ardennes. Atticus lay in bed with a book Earl had offered him, more Bradbury, a short story collection called Dark Carnival. It was a nice gesture, but not really the best bedtime fare. After reading one story about a vampire family reunion and another very strange tale about a man who had his skeleton removed, Atticus shut the book, gazed for a moment at the Arkham House imprint on its spine, and set it aside. He reached for his trousers and got out the letter from his father. Reading it over again, he touched a finger to a word written near the bottom of the page. Arkham, he whispered. The rain stopped at three in the morning. Atticus opened his eyes in the silence, unsure at first what country he was in. He dressed in the dark and crept downstairs, thinking to leave a note, but Earl was awake, sitting at the kitchen table with a cigarette. Sneaking out, Earl said to Atticus, Yes, sir. I appreciate the hospitality, but I need to get home. Earl nodded and made a little shoeing gesture with his cigarette hand. Tell Mrs. Mabry thank you for me. Tell her I said goodbye. Earl made the shoeing gesture again. Atticus got in his car and drove off through the dark and still damp streets, feeling like the ghost in whose bed he had slept. By first light, he was well to the north. He passed a sign reading Chicago, 52. The state trooper was parked in the shoulder on the opposite side of the road. The trooper had been napping, and had Atticus come even five minutes earlier, he might have passed by unnoticed. But in the pink dawn light, the trooper sat up blinking and yawning. He saw Atticus driving by and came fully alert. Atticus watched in the rear view as the patrol car made a U-turn onto the road. He got the Cadillac's registration and bill of sale from the glove box and put them on the passenger seat, along with his driver's license, everything in plain sight so there'd be no confusion about what he was reaching for. Lights flashed in the rear view and the police siren came on. 
Atticus pulled over, rolled down his window, and as he'd been taught to do in his very first driving lesson, gripped the top of the steering wheel with both hands. The trooper took his time getting out of the patrol car, stopping to stretch before ambling up alongside the Cadillac. Is this your car, he began. Yes, sir, Atticus said. Without taking his hands off the wheel, he inclined his head towards the papers in the passenger seat. Show me. Atticus handed him the documents. Atticus Turner, the state trooper said, reading the name off his license. You know why I stopped you? No, sir, Atticus lied. You weren't, spe you weren't speeding, the trooper assured him. But when I saw your license plate, I got worried you might be lost. Florida is the other way. Atticus gripped the wheel a little tighter. I'm going to Chicago, sir. What for? Family, my dad needs me. But you live in Florida? I've been working down in Jacksonville since I got out of the service. The trooper yawned without bothering to cover his mouth. Been working or still working? Sir, are you going back to Florida? No, sir, I don't plan to. You don't plan to. So you're staying in Chicago? For a while. How long? I don't know, as long as my father needs me. And then what? I don't know, I haven't decided. You haven't decided, the trooper frowned. But you're just passing through here, right? Yes, sir, Atticus said, resisting the temptation to add, if you'll let me. Still frowning, the trooper shoved the documents back through the window. Atticus replaced them on the passenger seat. What's in there, the trooper asked next, pointing at the basket on the floor. What's left of my lunch from yesterday? What about in back? Anything in the trunk? Just my clothes, Atticus said. My army uniform. Some books. What kind of books? Science fiction, mostly. Science fiction? And this is your car? Officer, step out. The, the trooper moved back from the door and placed a hand on the butt of his revolver. Atticus got out of the car slowly. Standing, he was an inch taller than the trooper. His reward for this impertinence was to be spun around, shoved up against the Cadillac, and roughly frisked. All right, said the trooper. Open the trunk. The trooper pawed through Atticus's clothes first, patting down the sides of his duffel bag as if it too were a black man braced against a car. Then he turned to the books, dumping the box out into the trunk. Atticus tried not to care, telling himself paperbacks were meant to be abused, but it was hard, like watching friends get knocked around. What's this? The trooper picked up a gift-wrapped object that had been at the bottom of the box. Another book, Atticus said. It's a present for my uncle. The trooper tore off the wrapping paper, revealing a hardbound volume, A Princess of Mars. He looked sideways at Atticus. Your uncle likes princesses, does he? He tossed the book into the box, Atticus dying a little as it landed splayed open, bending pages. The trooper circled the Cadillac. When he opened the passenger door, Atticus thought he was going after the Martian Chronicles, which was still up front somewhere. But the trooper came up holding the safe Negro travel guide. He thumbed through it, at first puzzled and then astonished. These addresses, he said, these are all places that serve colored people? Atticus nodded. Well, said the trooper, if that doesn't beat everything. He squinted at the guide edge on. Not very thick, is it? Atticus didn't respond to that. All right, the trooper said finally. I'm going to let you go, but I'm keeping this guidebook. Don't worry, he added, forestalling the objection that Atticus knew better than to make. You won't need it anymore. You say you're going to Chicago? Well, between here and there, there's no place that you want to stop. Understood? Atticus understood. So Atticus and his father have been on the outs for the last four years or so since he joined the military. His dad's kind of mad at him for fighting for a country that doesn't respect him. Um, but now, out of the blue, he's gotten this letter in which his father claims to have uh, uncovered some sort of secret about his Atticus's late mother's ancestry. And he's not very clear about what the secret is, but it's got something to do with the, the place that, uh, it's got something to do with an inheritance or a legacy that Atticus is supposedly entitled to. Um, so now he wants Atticus to come home so they can go together to this place that his mother's people supposedly came from so they can collect what's his. And the problem is that the place he wants to go is Arkham, Massachusetts, um, which is a completely fictional city from the works of H.P. Lovecraft. And um, Atticus knows his father wouldn't joke about this sort of thing. So the question arises, has his father gone mad while he's been away? Um, so he's rushing home to find out. But by the time he gets back to Chicago, his father has already left town in the company of a mysterious white man. So Atticus is forced to set out after him um, with his uncle, who is the publisher of the Safe Negro Travel Guide. And um, 
This sets off a chain of events that eventually draws Atticus's entire extended family into a series of real life weird tales. Um, so the second part I'm going to read to you is from one of these other stories. Um, it involves Atticus's childhood friend Letitia. And um, this chapter is called Dreams of the Witch House, W-H-I-C-H. -H. Um, and Letitia, like Atticus, has come into a surprise inheritance from her father. Um, and she decides she wants to spend the money buying a house that she can turn into a boarding house. And she wants to get a nice place with extra rooms. So she realizes she's probably going to buy property in a white neighborhood, which is not going to be easy. Um, and in addition to the obvious hurdles, um, at this point in time, it was almost impossible for black people to get mortgages. Um, basically, the Federal Housing Administration, which insures mortgages, wouldn't insure mortgages at that, at that time in black neighborhoods or mixed race neighborhoods or neighborhoods likely to become black or mixed race. So basically, if you were an African American, you, you just couldn't get a mortgage. Um, so your two choices were to pay the, for the house in cash, which almost nobody can afford. Um, the other option was something called a purchase contract with the seller of the house, which is a sort of a, a rent to own scheme. And the, the payment structure is kind of like a mortgage in that there's a down payment followed by a series of monthly payments. But the important difference is you don't have any equity. So if you default on a payment, you lose everything. You lose the house, you lose all the money you've put into it. And so unscrupulous real estate dealers would take advantage of this. They would offer these purchase contracts to people they knew were very likely to default. They would often build traps into the contracts, balloon payments that would make it certain they would default. And so they could sell the same house over and over and over again, each time collecting a down payment, getting as much money from the person as they could, then they'd evict them and sell it to somebody else. So, Letitia knows all this. She knows the game's rigged, but it's the only way to get what she wants. And she's going to walk through fire if she has to to get this house. So, um, so she and her sister Ruby have gone to see the, the real estate dealer. And um, technically, this is Ruby's inheritance money, too. But Letitia is driving the bus at this point. The words on the frosted glass pane read Harold Bailey, realtist. Realtist, a Negro real estate broker. Not to be confused with a white realtor whose national association Negroes could not join. A pair of decals indicated Mr. Bailey was also a member of the Prince Hall Freemasons and the improved order of Elks. The lights in Mr. Bailey's office were out and the door was locked. Letitia, standing in the third floor hallway with Ruby, tried to control her impatience. A bystander might not have guessed they were sisters. Letitia, slender and light-skinned, favored her father. Ruby, curvy and dark, suggested a youthful mama, but a mama who could be pushed around. Her pliability wasn't limitless, though, and there was a core of genuine mama within her that could emerge, given time, like a mountain rising from the sea. The trick was getting what you wanted from her before you ran aground. So far, Ruby seemed willing to play along with Letitia's scheme, but if this morning's meeting had to be rescheduled, she might start having other ideas. He said 9 o'clock. Well, I promised Mrs. Parker I'd be over to watch Clarice by 11.30, Ruby said, and I was hoping to stop into Mantle Brothers' basements to look for shoes for that new catering job I told you about. I don't see what you want to start another job for, Letitia said. Now that we got this, of course you don't see. You need to know how to hold down one steady job before you can talk about another. I am going to have a steady job now, Ruby. That's what this is all about, security. Yeah, big landlady on Easy Street, Ruby sighed. We could still give the money to the church. Ruby, Letitia was horrified. You didn't tell anyone from church, did you? No, don't worry, Uncle Pennybags. I didn't give away your secret. You better not have. Daddy wanted us to have this money. Ruby snorted, like you care what Daddy wanted. I do care, and I care about you, which brought another snort. You want to spend the rest of your life living in one tiny room? Of course I don't, but, and hard as you work, when's the last time you came into a fortune like this? Never, Ruby said. That's how I know not to trust it. A door opened at the far end of the hall. The sisters turned to look at the white man who'd come out to look at them. Miss Dandridge, the man said. I'm Miss Dandridge, said Letitia, feeling Ruby bristle beside her. We both are. I'm John Archibald. I'm a friend of Mr. Bailey's. He asked me to tell you that he won't be able to meet with you today. Oh. He also told me what it is you're here for. I'd be happy to help you myself, if you'd like. He stepped farther into the hall as he said this, and Letitia, looking past him at the open door, saw the word realtor painted in reverse on the glass. 
Of course, he added, noting her hesitation, if you'd rather wait for Mr. Bailey. Ruby's hand was on Letitia's arm, tugging. Let's go. But it might be another week before Ruby had free time again. Too long. You and Mr. Bailey, Letitia said. Are you just friends or partners, Mr. Archibald said. Silent partners. These are all white neighborhoods. Yes, said Mr. Archibald. That's what Hal told me you were interested in. Nobody told me anything about white neighborhoods. Ruby looked pointedly at Letitia, who went right on turning pages in the three-ring binder Mr. Archibald had offered them. There's something I don't understand about these prices, Letitia said. Like these two buildings here, they look almost the same in terms of square footage and lot size, but the first one's so much cheaper. She showed him the listings. It's a matter of location, Mr. Archibald explained, but they're on the same street. Different blocks, though. With that first property, the block is still entirely white-owned. As I'm sure I don't have to tell you, it can be difficult to be the first Negro to break into a block. We don't want difficult, said Ruby. Definitely not. So in this case, the seller, an investor Hal and I both know, has agreed to offer what we call a first-in discount. Once that first sale goes through, subsequent sales become much easier. Eventually, as in the case of that second property, things reach a tipping point where ownership of the whole block can turn over in only a year or two. Lots of commissions for you, Letitia said. Lots of commissions for me and Mr. Bailey, he corrected her, and lots of new homes for deserving Negro families. Letitia nodded. Fair enough. It wasn't, but she couldn't be too outraged by a practice she hoped to benefit from. The real problem was, even with the first in discount, she wasn't sure she could afford what she wanted. And however much of a straight shooter he made himself out to be, she didn't doubt Mr. Archibald would gladly take her money for a property she'd end up defaulting on. She turned another page in the binder. This can't be right, she said, reading over the listing. This price can't be right, can it? Mr. Archibald leaned forward to see what property she was looking at. Oh, he said, the winter pass. The witch house, Letitia said. It's ugly, said Ruby. It'll be prettier once it's ours, Letitia replied, like a baby. <laughs> Noon of the following Sunday, and the sisters in their church clothes stood before a boxy edifice whose brick exterior exhibited all the charm of a public school building. But it was the inside Letitia cared about. Looking up, she could see the glass tent of the skylight that, according to the property listing, capped a two-story atrium surrounded by 14 other rooms. 14 rooms. The apartment Letitia and her siblings had grown up in had had just two, plus a shared bathroom on a different floor. The Winter House shared its narrow block with a defunct tavern in an overgrown lot that had at one time been a park. The block was on the west side of a two-lane street. The east side was lined with small, single-family homes, all white-owned. A woman sitting on the porch of the cottage directly opposite the Winter House had watched with trepidation as Letitia and Ruby approached and was now glaring openly at them. It's a lot longer trip to work from here, too, Ruby said. Yeah, but when you come home, you'll be able to stretch out and be comfortable. I'm comfortable where I am. This will be more comfortable, Letitia insisted. She looked up again at a rust-eaten chair perched incongruously at the roof's northeast corner. Must be a nice view. I wonder if you can see the lake from here. She turned around smiling and was met by the white woman's hostile stare. Yeah, nice view, said Ruby, casting her own glance across the street. I'm sure we'll be real comfortable. Mr. Archibald arrived a few minutes later. He tipped his hat to the glowering white woman and hustled Letitia and Ruby inside. Dust motes floated in the sunlight, streaming down onto the atrium's chessboard floor. Archways to the left and right of the front door gave access to what Mr. Archibald identifies as a dining room and a, and a, and a parlor, though given the absence of furniture, they had to take his word for it. Stairs ran up the atrium's right wall to a gallery and back, with more doorways visible above and below. Letitia approached the atrium centerpiece, a sheet-draped figure standing inside a raised marble ring. The property listing had mentioned a fountain, but it hadn't occurred to her that it might be indoors. May I, she asked. Please, said Mr. Archibald. Letitia grabbed a fold of the sheet and pulled, unveiling a naked divinity cast in bronze. Lord, said Ruby. The bronze idol, her hair pinned up with a crescent moon tiara, gripped two massive torches, one in each hand, their flames rising past the level of her shoulders. A skeleton key dangled between her bare breasts. At her feet was a basket of hissing snakes, copper tubing in their coils feeding down into the guts of the fountain. Hecate, Mr. Archibald said helpfully, goddess of the moon. I see the moon, all right, said Letitia, circling around to the fountain's rear. Two additional faces sprouted from the back of Hecate's head like something out of a carnival freak show. A chorus of toads, spigot-mouthed like the snakes, formed an unsightly mound behind her heels. This is gonna have to go. 
I can certainly speak to the seller about it, Mr. Archibald said, but as I explained yesterday, under the terms of the purchase contract, yeah, I was paying attention because she wouldn't own the house until it was paid off. Any significant alterations to the property had to be approved by the seller. You sure I can't talk to them directly? No, I'm afraid not. The property listing said the Winthrop House was owned by Penumbra Real Estate, which Letitia assumed was run by Mr. Archibald's investor friend, or perhaps by Mr. Archibald himself. All communication with Penumbra was to go through him. I'll convey your concern. Be sure you do, Letitia sniffed. The kind of tenants we're hoping to rent to, families, church-going folk, they're not going to like this at all. Reflecting as she said it that Southside Negroes would put up with a lot worse than pagan statuary to get a roof over their heads. But they shouldn't have to put up with it, she thought. And for sure, she didn't want to look at Hecate's moon every day. She shifted her attention to a pair of dark doorways, one up on the gallery, one directly beneath it, both screened by iron accordion gates. That's the elevator? Yes, Mr. Archibald said. The builder of the house, Hiram Winthrop, had it installed for his wife. She'd had polio, he explained. You hear that, Ruby, Letitia said? Polio, like Marvin. Marvin climbed stairs just fine, Ruby replied. Well, not everyone does. That could be a selling point for tenants. Old people, she thought. Quiet, easy to get along with, paid their rent on time. The elevator does need to be repaired, Mr. Archibald noted, the delicacy with which he said this, making it plain whose responsibility that would be. Ruby snorted. Of course it does. What else is wrong with the house? The wiring needs to be looked at. The power is off right now, but the last occupant reported that fuses were blowing constantly. Also, no, Ruby said. What's wrong with it? She fixed him with a narrow-eyed stare, Mama peering up from the depths. A house this size with a price this low and you're willing to let us have it? That's about more than a fuse box. What aren't you telling us? Mr. Archibald hesitated. It was plain from his expression that he'd been waiting for this question and was even relieved that the subject had been broached, yet still he wasn't sure how to answer. Letitia saved him the trouble. It's haunted. What? said Ruby. It's a haunted house. What else could it be? She looked at Mr. Archibald, who confirmed her guess by not saying no. So who's the ghost? Mrs. Winthrop? She ride her wheelchair up and down the halls at night? I honestly don't know, Mr. Archibald said. I... Wait a minute, said Ruby. This is true? All I've heard are stories. Mr. Archibald raised a hand, scouts honor. I haven't experienced any phenomena myself, nor do I expect to. But it's true that some prior occupants have reported incidents. Bumps in the night, and the last several attempts to sell the house have all ended with the buyers backing out. And when were you planning on mentioning this, exactly? Miss Dandridge, please. I wasn't trying to withhold information from you, but I consider myself a rational man. I don't believe in... It's okay, Letitia said. We're not afraid of dead people. Letitia? One thing, though. Now that the cat's out of the bag, you think the seller might come down on the price even more? Letitia? Ruby? Matching her tone for tone. It's got an elevator. <laughs> so, um, it sort of should give you an idea of what you're in for. Um, and each of the characters has their own mini adventure, mini weird tale, in addition to the larger story of, of Arkham, Massachusetts. Um, and hopefully by the time you get to the end of it, you will have the, the warm feeling of having binge watched a really good season of TV. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so that's my basic spiel. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, Rose. <laughs> um, have you come across any interesting, I guess, like, points of view of writing about people of color and black people in particular as a white author? A lot of white people seem to be really worried about it. <laughs> That's been the main thing. I, I, at every reading I've been to, somebody has told me how courageous I am for tackling the subject. And I kind of get it, but I kind of don't. It, it's, it's, for me, this was really a labor of love. I, I like writing stories from the points of view of characters that are not like me, that are give me a chance to sort of imagine life with maybe the same sensibility, but completely different constraints and limitations in history, and, and seeing how that would be different. And um, I think the thing that really drew me into this was, was learning about the, the black tourist guides and just the idea of this 
I never really thought about this, this infrastructure that had been built up for dealing with life in segregation times, that, that there were just all these mechanisms that had to be put in place just to allow people to, to do something as simple as drive cross country. So that was just really fascinating to me and, and I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to live in that, that viewpoint for a while. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've talked about this in other readings. I, I think part of the reason white portrayals of black characters are often so dreadful is because the people who are doing them are not, they don't really want to do it. They feel like they have to diversify or they have to embrace diversity or something. And when you're doing something as a chore, it, it, it shows and it comes across and you cut corners and you use cliches and, and it's no fun for anybody. But um, yeah, I really wanted to live with these characters and I, I had a great time doing it. So. Um, and I'm pleased that the, the African American readers who I've heard from so far seem to think I, I did okay. So, I, so yeah, that's been the, that's been the general thing. But yes, every every reading I go to, there's somebody like, oh, this is so courageous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it was fun. So, and yes. The New York Public Library has digitized their collection. Um, there, there were a number of different ones. These were, but the most famous is, is what was called the Negro Motorist Green Book, or just the Green Book. And it was um, published by a postman named Victor Hugo Green, originally in New York City, and then he moved to Hackensack, New Jersey. And um, he corresponded with other postmen around the country, and they would send him leads. And that was how he got his research done. And um, you know, initially he just did it to help out people in the metropolitan area, but these were enormously popular. And he was inspired, there were earlier guides for Jewish travelers who had similar problems. Um, so from, I think, around 1936 to 1966, he published, and um, uh, his goal was to go out of business, and, and unfortunately he, he died in 1960, so I think it was his family that, that published the last round of guides, and it, they were finally able to shut down in 66 after the Civil Rights Act, you know, made, made it no longer necessary. Um, but yeah, the New York Public Library has got the full collection of Green Books online. If you just search for Green Book, you'll find it, and you can page through them. And I actually, this is from the 1954 guy. This is the page for Seattle. So you've got, for hotels, the Atlas Hotel, you've got the YWCA, and then six other hotels. Um, all in the International District, um, which is not a coincidence. And these weren't the only places you could stay, but they were places where you could be sure that you could stay. And if you, you know, if you tried to rent a hotel downtown, they, they could legally tell you, oh, we don't, we don't take your kind here, but you know, they might also just have lost your reservation somehow. You know, you might drive down Aurora, stop at half a dozen motels, and, and all of them had just forgotten to switch on the no vacancy sign until they saw you getting out of your car. So just to save yourself that humiliation and frustration and waste of time, the guides were really useful and essential. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting and, and also kind of fed into this was that um, the guides were actually much more useful in the North and the West. In the traditional South, where they were proud of their racist heritage and segregation, it was much easier to know where you stood. Generally, if, if the place wasn't specifically marked for colored, you knew you couldn't stay there. North and West, you, were, you, you, would, you could encounter signs, but a lot of times you were flying blind. And again, it was, it was often more difficult. You'd get the same level of prejudice, but people didn't always necessarily want to admit it. So it was, you could be driven mad just trying to get people just at least tell me that you're not renting to me because I'm black. So, um, and that too sort of feeds into the idea of Lovecraft, whose characters, if they're not killed, are always going crazy. So it's sort of a way in which, yeah, um, bridges all worlds. So, um, yes. Oh wow! Well. I don't know. There were there were a lot of little bits of business, some of which I I couldn't find a place for in the book. But um, I guess I was just continually surprised by every time I thought I'd I'd read everything, I'd I'd stumble across something else. Like I 
Um, one of the things I did for research, I read through a years back issues of the Chicago Defender, which was the, pretty much the biggest black newspaper in the country, I think, and they are, their archives are available at the UW. So I was just looking through that for anecdotes, and there was a story about Chicago had held a nuclear air raid um, drill, you know, where, because this was, this was back when they thought that you could actually get into nuclear air raid shelters and survive a, a first strike. But they had to, the Chicago Defender was letting people know this because the sirens didn't work in the south side, so they didn't know that there had been a drill. So had, had there actually been a nuclear attack, they just would have been out in the open. Um, would they have been accepted in shelters anyway? Uh, you know, the basements in the south side, yeah. I suppose. They wouldn't have, yeah, that, that, but yeah, they, they, the sirens either weren't there or didn't work. Um, uh, there is a, there's a bit of business in the book later on where Atticus and his father are looking for the house of this guy that they want to get a book from. And they come to what they think is the address and there is a, sign, a marquee sign up on the garage of the house next door saying nigger lover with a neon arrow pointing at the house that, they, that they're looking for. And what they find out is the guy living in the house is a, a lawyer who helped the NAACP um, desegregate the school system in that county so the neighbors put up this sign so that everyone will know whose house to throw stones at. Everything about that story is true except the part about the marquee, which I threw in just to, to make clear what the point of the arrow was. But there was, there was a case in Cairo, Illinois, where the local NAACP lawyer, a white man, helped desegregate the, the school system. And so his neighbor put up a neon arrow to let people know whose house to stone. And Langston Hughes, who wrote a, daily, a weekly column in the Chicago Defender, went down to visit him and drove up with a friend. and. As soon as their car stopped, the front door burst open and the guy comes running out with a baseball bat because he had learned in the years since he'd, he'd done this case, any time a car he didn't recognize stopped in front of the house, he was about to have a window broken. And so it's like, um, so yeah, little things like that. It's just like you, you read stuff that you can't believe, but yeah, it happened all the time. So, um, and I'm sure there are others, but yeah, so you sort of get the idea anyway. Mm. Now, what were the Lovecraft stories that you found most um, instrumental when do you or write or influence you in writing them? I don't know that it was any specific story so much as just the mood. Um, Lovecraft is really a master of dread, where you're you're constantly like that. They're they're once in a while he'll throw in a chase scene, but much of the story is just you, you know that these guys are poking around where they don't belong, and and something bad is going to happen eventually. Um, and to me, that that just sort of works so perfectly. The experience of yes, driving cross country where you you need a book to show you where even where you can stop safely. That just sort of seemed to tie in very nicely with what I was trying to do. Um, I mean, of of his stories, I'm a big fan of the the um, at the Mountains of Madness and um, Shadow over Innsmouth is fascinating because it it's it's all of Lovecraft's racist obsessions on full display, and yet you could change the story just a little, and it would work perfectly as a story about a, a black man trapped in a sundown town overnight. Because basically, yeah, a guy guy is on vacation, stops in the wrong town sees too much, can't leave, and then after dark the whole town turns out to get him. And yes, in the story, he's a, he's a white guy who, who's actually very approving of race prejudice and goes out of his way to let you know that during the story. And he's being chased by you know hybrid fish demons from the sea. <laughs> but there are echoes in that of, you know, yeah, of just much more realistic stories. Even the way the guy gets out of town by sneaking out along the railroad tracks um, one of the other stories I, I touch on in this, the, there was a, an awful race riot in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 where basically white Tulsa went to war against black Tulsa and burned it to the ground or as much of it as they could before the National Guard arrived. And um, some of the people who escaped did that by following the railroad tracks. That was, that was the one way they were able to get out when the the white locals had pretty much surrounded the town otherwise. Um, so I kept yeah, just seeing parallels like that. Um, so, yes. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, so the first one is, 
in your research, something that I've been really interested in knowing more about is, did you find that there were slight differences in the way African American handles the supernatural versus mainstream white American? Not that I've noticed. Um, I mean, I may, I just may not have read widely enough. I mean, I, I find that everybody's different in the way they write anyway, so I, I don't think I'd characterize a white or an African American way of approaching the subject, if that makes sense. I think that the main difference would just probably be, particularly in, in stories written more than, if, you know, the last couple of decades, it's, it's African Americans are much more likely to write about African Americans than, than white authors are, but that's not really about how they handle the supernatural aspects. Um, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't really have a, a, a characteristic difference now. Okay. Um, uh, my other question is, uh, since this was not uh, picked up as a TV series, would you, would you consider adapting this into a comic? Somebody else asked me this online. I, I don't know that I would adapt it myself, but I could certainly see doing a, like I'm still hoping that we can, we can now that I've got sort of a proof of concept, I would love to, I would love to see if I could still convince someone on television, because it feels more timely now too than when I first pitched it in 2007. But yeah, and then do a, do a comic as a spinoff. Can I ask another follow-up? Sure. Well, um, since 2007, we've had this big burst of the, uh, the, like the Netflix and the Amazon channel. And the, you know, yeah, that's what I'm hoping, yeah, is that, yeah. that one of those formats would work for it. Um, well, my, my, my CAA agent is working on it, and, but he, as he always says when he's, he's trying to give me you know, flattering bad news, he's like, yes, the, the, pro <laughs> the problem with my books is that my ideas are original enough in a way that scares people in Hollywood. So, um, but I'm, I am hopeful that this, will, this one will eventually find a home somewhere. So, and, um, and also, unlike, you know, I, I'm generally not a fan of sequels because I generally feel that if, if a book is well written, it uses up the idea that made it worth writing. Um, but this is really the first time I, I still find myself thinking about these characters wanting to do more with the story. So it ends in 1955, and I could see carrying it on to an ending right around the time that the Safe Negro Travel Guide ceases publication. And I've, I've, I've been thinking about it even though I, I, I don't know at all whether my publisher would be up for that yet, but it's, that's one of the things I've been sort of sticking with me. Um, yeah. So, yes? I'm just curious about the writing. So you, you came up with this, well, no, I don't know when you came up with this, since 2007. Yeah. How long since you, when you started the book did it take you to finish it, and are you working on something else in between at the times, or is it all what, what, focused on this? No, what happened was I, I, I had this interaction with some folks who were affiliated with Fox Studios, and they, they wanted to know if I had ideas for original TV series, and I, I pitched them three different things, and none of which went over. Um, and the first one was, was The Mirage, which was actually my last novel. So. I just, you know, once, once it was clear it wasn't going to happen as a show, I thought, well, I think I know how I can make this work as a novel. So I sat down and started working on that. And Lovecraft Country was a more complicated idea in part because for the Mirage, I'd like mapped out like three seasons worth of stuff, of subplots and whatever. But, but by stripping away all of the extraneous things and focusing on the central mystery, I got an arc that was very much like a traditional novel. This was, it was like, Using the X-Files metaphor, it was like the individual episodes, the Monster of the Week episodes, were as important to the idea. It was partly about just letting, letting these characters star in the kinds of stories that African Americans traditionally have not starred in. Um, so I didn't want to just have one story. I wanted a collection of stories. And I needed to figure out a way to make that work that would still feel like a novel and would still feel complete and, and stand alone when you were done with it. Um, so when I was not, you know, when I was writing The Mirage, this was what I would think about when I was procrastinating. And um, I wrote a short story called Safe Negro Travel Guide, a sort of a trial run for uh, Richard Hugo House. Uh, they had, they had a, an event where it was me and Amy Bender and someone else whose name I can't remember. And we were, we were commissioned to write stories on the theme of travel. And I was like, ah, I know. I know what I can do. Um, and that went over really well, and that just sort of further convinced me to work on it. So I think I, I started writing this, was it 2012, I guess? Well, that's when Mirage was published, so it makes sense. 
probably, yeah, towards the end of 2012, early 2013. And um, yeah, I, I finished it towards the end of 2014. And then I, I had this interesting experience where I went through four editors very quickly because they all kept leaving Harper to go elsewhere. <laughs> so um, that sort of extended the editing process a little longer than otherwise. But so yeah, I would say it was probably you know, five years thinking about it and then another three working on it. So, <laughs> well, thank you all for coming and I'm happy to sign books or answer more questions on the side here.